to record this to the cloud. Um, all right, you guys, so this is very exciting. Uh, a lot of you, or maybe none of you, but just in case <laughs> you're wondering uh, why the Archaeology Club is presenting about spirit photography. Um, I think that uh, photography as an artifact and as a document has a lot to do with archaeology. We use these in two different ways. It's an object that people interacted with in their daily lives, mm -hmm. and therefore it's an artifact. It's a man-made object or person-made object. Um, that's something that people had that uh, maybe showed status or um, had some other meaning to them. But at the same time, it was manipulated uh, in certain ways to present a certain image to the world. So I think with photographs, we're talking about uh, both an artifact and also um, something that might be considered a kind of unreliable or very reliable narrator about the past. Um, so they influence the way that we see the past and can be used in a variety of different ways. So there is my attempt to connect this to archaeology, um, which I would have done even if I did not believe that all of that was true, because I am fascinated by spirit photography. I find it very interesting. And uh, Sherry is a um, she's a photographer, an educator, a MICA graduate, an all around excellent uh, weirdo and dear <laughs> friend um, who is going to is an encyclopedic knowledge of these things. Um, we had a conversation a while ago about spirit photography, and I found it so delightful. I was thrilled that um, that she could join us to talk about that this evening. So just right before she starts, um, I am going to tell you if you have questions, please type them into the chat box and I will um, ask them for you at the end. Um, and depending on how much time we have, we might have time for a free for all or we might not, um, but please do type, type your questions into the chat box. Uh, so with that, I give you Sherry Inslee, spirit photography expert extraordinaire, and I'm going to try to share my screen here so that we can get started with the presentation. All right, can everybody see that? Is that good? I know. Okay. Hang on one second, I need to... Oop. I'm gonna make this smaller. So, sorry, we're having some couple technical issues, but hold on. Is it to me now? Oh, okay. Am I freezing up? No, no, you no? okay. This is, hang on one second. I just, froze up, hold on. Okay, there we go. Now, all right, everything okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so um, thank you, Lisa, for inviting me. Um, first disclaimer, I am not a historian. I am just a huge enthusiast um, and a big weirdo, as uh, you may already know. <laughs> um, so, um, I have a super big interest in uh, photography and the occult um, and the history of photography um, as an art form um, and also as a science. Um, so uh, there, it goes hands in, hand in hand, um, this discovering the inner invention of photography. Um, but we're gonna talk about ghosts and um, the dark arts today. Um, so, it's generally believed that spirit photography began in earnest in Boston around 1861. And so photography itself was really, really new at this time. And it really was like an act of sorcery. Um, the, the photographer used a mysterious device and worked in darkness to conjure forth an image out of nothing. Um, and so the likes of this had like never been seen before. Um, and prior to the invention of photography, the only way to depict images of people or places was to paint portraits. And um, this wasn't practical um, and was limited only to people of means. So when photography was born, this changed everything. Uh, suddenly you can create multiples of images and, um, and it's a much less time consuming and much less expensive way. Um, and people became entranced with this new technology and they began pushing the boundaries of it um, and thinking about how can this technology be used to document. Um, so if we're gonna go to the next slide. Um, 
So here we have William Mumler, um, who I'm going to be focusing more on. Um, there's a huge, so the spirit photography and spiritualism is a huge, huge era, era in um, photography and the history of photography, but we're going to be really kind of focusing on um, sort of like the father of spirit photography, which is William H. Mumler. And he is arguably the most famous and infamous uh, spirit photographer. And as all good creation stories begin, this too begins innocently with a mistake. Um, so William Mumler, he is an engraver by trade uh, for the Bigelow Brothers Fine Jewelry and Silversmiths. And he works in a shop across the street from a brand new photographic portrait studio. So next slide. So this is a typical sort of Victorian era portrait studio. Um, obviously they're working with natural light. So you see the whole glass walls and um, skylights to let in natural light. And you see the photographer um, with the big four by five or eight by 10 camera. Um, and the, the studios were set up a lot like parlors. And so you would come in and have your portrait taken. Um, so let's see. Um, Um, so Mumler is working across the street from this photography studio and um, he becomes employed part-time as well at the photography studio uh, because he has a lot of familiarity with chemistry and with the fine technical work to be able to help out um, in the photography studio and be an assistant. Um, and then Mumler soon becomes enamored with the studio owner who is a, su a certain Mrs. Hannah Green Stewart. And so um, Hannah, you wanna go to the next slide. Um, we have a, we think this is a picture of Hannah Green Stewart. Um, not entirely sure, but we think that this is Hannah Green Stewart. And so Hannah was an entrepreneur and a total badass. Um, prior to owning her own photography studio, Hannah supported herself by creating sentimental and memorial objects with braided hair called hair work. Um, this is another weird passion of mine. Um, <laughs> um, so um, hair work is often, but not totally limited to mourning rituals with the Victorians. Um, and despite the Victorians often macabre fascination with death, um, hair work was often just like a sentimental piece of art. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, so here's a couple examples of hair work. Um, she, this is on the left is um, a portrait like in a locket and that, that braided material around it, that's all hair that is like finely braided and then created into a, a piece of art, a sentimental piece of art um, and then the piece on the right is um, is uh, is a hair wreath and with a photograph. And so um, often the Victorians would take hair from loved ones or friends and um, weave it into these very um, intricate and delicate pieces and combine it with photography for these sentimental um, pieces of art. Also for um, for mourning pieces, me memento mor mor memento mori pieces. Um, and so often the hair work would be incorporated into a locket or a brooch. And um, prior to the invention of photography, it would have a, a small painted portrait. Um, but once photography became more accessible to others, um, Hannah was like, hmm, I smell a business opportunity. So Hannah, the entrepreneur that she was, decided that she could take the photos herself. And so she learned the dark art of photography and she acquired the equipment and she opened her own studio. And her services were not limited to the sentimental hair work and portrait photography. Hannah was also a gifted clairvoyant and healer. And so not only did she claim to be able to communicate with those who passed to the great beyond, she at times acted as a vessel for the voices of the dead. And so Mumler, who is not yet a spiritualist, 
was totally smitten with her. Um, and so we want to go to the next slide. This is an, another example of sentimental Victorian era hair work um, with a cabinet card portrait. Um, and this would be like in a frame. So next slide. So what is spiritualism? Um, and according to Wikipedia, and this is quote, it is a religious movement based on the belief that the spirits of the dead exist and have both the ability and the inclination to communicate with the living. The afterlife or the spirit world is seen by spiritualists not as a static place, but one in which spirits continue to evolve. So it's active. Um, and here is where I find the spiritualist movement fascinating. And that is because women play a really interesting role in the spiritualist movement. So you gotta think that this is a time where in traditional religious movements or institutions, there's not a lot of space for women. And so spiritualism really gives women a voice, gives them power. So the women are the conduits, they're the mediums, they're the bridge to the spirit world. And the spiritualist movement is centered around these women. And um, so the creation story of the spiritualist movement begins in upstate New York. And like several other historical movements, it begins with a bunch of bored teenage girls. So next slide. So here we have the Fox sisters. And the Fox sisters are really the first celebrity spirit communicators. Um, they claimed they could communicate with the spirit world by holding seances and interpreting the knocks and taps on the walls and furniture that the spirits were making. They claimed that they had contacted the spirit of a man who was murdered in their farmhouse and that he was able to speak to them through a series of knocks and raps. Um, it's later revealed, many years later, that the girls were cleverly popping their toe joints in their shoes to create the noises, but they totally hoodwinked their parents and their parents just couldn't believe it. Um, and they were convinced that they are, their daughters had made contact with the, the spirit world. And so the, spirit, the parents started inviting neighbors over to witness the phenomenon. And then hundreds of people began flocking to Rochester. Um, and then before long, they became so popular, they took their show on the road, literally, and began performing and touring across the country. Um, this also prompted many others to find other ways to communicate with um, the other side and a real movement began. Um, and you have to think, so the country is devastated after the civil war and is in mourning as it never has been before with over three quarters of a million dead in the civil war. And so what started as a childish prank became an entire movement and sort of a receptacle for the nation's grief and loss. Um, the popularity of spiritualism, it ebbs and flows over the years. Um, and it tends to really kind of ramp up um, in times of great strife. Um, and it's at this time, it's embraced as a, not only as a matter of faith, but also a matter of science because of the inclusion of photography. So next slide. Um, so, Spirit photography is not isolated to this time period only. It, um, it tends to pop up whenever technology intersects with people's desires to reach out across the divide um, of life and death. And um, so also as a result during this time period, post-mortem photography was very popular with the Victorians in the Victorian era. Um, I didn't include any examples of post-mortem um, photography just because it can be disturbing. Um, but I did include this lovely daguerreotype of, um, of the lost companion, um, which is a pet owner with his loyal um, Springer Spaniel. Um, but the reason I'm including it and talking about it is because um, is it, it was very popular to the Victorians to document postmortem, um, not only because it gave them the chance to like have a, a picture of their loved one um, to hold on to, but it also was practical. 
Um, and it's not as creepy as it seems when you consider that the process of early photography was really, really long. Like the exposure time could be two, three minutes. Um, and so if you were just sitting there breathing or blinking your eyes or not able to hold completely still, your image would be, would be blurred. And so um, that's part of the practicality of post-mortem photography. Um, and photographing the dead was a practical way to commemorate them. Um, and especially true for a time where there was a high infant and child mortality rate. So next slide. So do you see the ghost in this, this photo? <laughs> um, this is just another example of a very distinct Victorian photography phenomenon called the hidden mother, which I think is hilarious. Um, so, and it was a way to keep squirmy children uh, still long enough to take their portrait. Because again, the exposure times were super long. And so they would often have to keep, they would have contraptions that would like keep people still. Um, and then they did this hidden mother technique where the mother would shroud herself and then hold the children during the, um, the, the photograph. So next slide. Um, okay, so we're going to go back to Mumler um, and his real ghosts. So um, this is not a photograph of Mumler. Um, this is just an example of a, again, a studio portrait setup. Um, and so we're going to go back to 1861, um, an ordinary October morning in 1861. And Mumler was in Hannah's studio organizing the chemicals and getting the camera ready and just preparing the equipment for the day's appointments. Um, and he'd been spending so much time in the studio that he had practically learned the art of photography just from being there, like through osmosis. Um, and so he's in there and he noticed how beautiful the morning light is and he decides that he's gonna take a self portrait. So he arranged the setting for a formal portrait. He draped the background, background and he had a chair and he picked up a couple other objects from the studio. So I'm gonna next slide. Um, next, he prepared the photographic plate for exposure, which is um, at this time we are using um, large sheets of glass to make glass, glass negatives, which are either four by five or eight by 10. Um, they're coated with a collodion, which is a mixture of ether and silver halide crystals. And um, so that makes the plate sensitive to light. Um, and all of this is done in the darkness. Um, further, you know, this mysterious nature of photography. Um, and then next he puts the dry plate in a wooden plate holder, which is on the, the left. Um, and this wooden plate holder is light tight. Then he slides the, um, the, the plate holder into the camera. Um, and then the wooden slat is blocking the light from entering the lens. And then Mumler checked his scene and he focused his lens. And then he pulled up the slat to start the exposure and he quickly stepped into his spot in front of the camera. And then he held perfectly still for a full two minutes as the light that was reflected off of him into the camera permanently etched his image onto the glass plate. And then later as he developed his negative in the dark room, he thought he'd done something very wrong. So next slide. So sitting in the empty chair he was resting his hand on was a girl made of light. And the studio had been empty all morning. Mumler found the image to be, quote, unaccountable. And he assumed he had improperly prepared the glass plate. And which is a careless error for, you know, a, a not professional photographer. And so he didn't think a lot about it, but Hannah thought otherwise. She thought not only was it a portrait of spirit, but she said it, and I quote, it was the image of one who had left her body behind yet had taken this method of communicating with those yet in the bondage to flesh. So Hannah was intense. Um, 
And she was really psyched about this. Um, and somehow it's debated who alerted the press to these goings on, but the image found its way into the hands of Dr. H.F. Gardner, um, who was the spiritualist who brought the Fox sisters to Boston. And he was a promoter for them. And so this image found his way to Dr. Gardner and the account of what happened when Mumler was creating the image. And then soon it was published in the Banner of Light and Herald of Progress um, newspaper for the spiritualist community. Um, and then all of a sudden, the studio is full of spiritualists flocking to see this image. So next slide. Um, so not long after this first astonishing image, Hannah Green Stewart becomes Hannah Mumler and their partnership becomes as much of, of a professional relationship as a domestic relationship. Um, Hannah would coax the spirits to appear during the sittings and she would describe in great detail the ghosts that she was seeing that the sitter couldn't see. And she would describe um, what was later gonna appear on the negative. So, and this is an image of, um, of Hannah taken by uh, William Mumler. Um, and we can see the faint image of somebody standing behind her. So next slide. So, um, among some of their earliest clients were some of Boston's most influential families, um, people of means who came to, to the spirit photographer um, because of either a devastating loss or a nagging emptiness that they couldn't describe or curiosity. Um, and each would enter the studio with a broken heart and then they would leave with a tangible reminder of their lost loved one. So we have a couple different um, images here on the on um, with different spirits um, interacting with the figure. Um, next slide. So parents of deceased children, families of soldiers lost in the war, grieving widows—they all flocked to Mumler Studio. So much so that um, the Mumlers had to limit their sittings to for a day because they were in such demand. And then this created even further demand for their services. So next slide. Um, and by now, Mumler is selling his portraits for $10 a piece, which is a huge sum of money in 1861. And this also created a lot of jealousy amongst the community of other Boston area photographers. And then something strange begins to happen. Um, soon some people, they begin to recognize the ghosts that were appearing in their portraits as people who were still alive. Um, there is a story of one woman uh, claimed that her image appeared in a Mumler portrait of someone else and she was wearing a really unfashionable hat and she was so upset about this that she would be portrayed to be so unfashionable in the afterlife that she had not yet entered. So um, it, the scandal was just building. So next slide. Um, and so this is the beginning of the public turning against Mumler in Boston. So what do the mumblers do? They quietly pack their things and they move their operations to New York City. And so there the mumblers started a new studio making spirit photographs and they opened a gallery for spirit photographs alongside all the fine art galleries. And they even got into the mail order game. So patrons didn't even have to come into the studio and have and sit for a portrait. Um, they started a deal where um, you could send them $7 and they would send you back a, a portrait of a spirit that was connected to you in some way. Um, and as one can imagine, this did not sit well with the established New York photographers. Um, but the real problems began when Mumler began reaching out to the other photographers, telling them that he could teach them how to take spirit photographs. So next slide. All right, does anybody recognize this fellow? Um, 
things are about to get even worse for the mumblers. Um, when this guy got involved, yes, P.T. Barnum, um, the creator of the greatest show on earth, who is a self-professed expert in frauds and the people who make them. So he buys several of Mumler's photographs to display in his American museum. And so he quote, he wrote, he quote, I wrote to Mumler saying that I wish to expose all the humbugs of the world. And when he's saying humbug, he's meaning frauds. And he sent me a lot of photographs and I paid him about $10 a piece. So in quote, um, Barnum, who he's an ardent anti-spiritualist, he and Houdini, and he spent a good deal of time and money debunking spiritualist claims. Um, he found them, their performances to be an insult to his role as an entertainer, which I think is, is pretty ironic. Um, so thus, mum, the Mumler's reputation as swindlers has now resurfaced in New York and an investigation is opened. So next slide. Um, so in 1869, Mumler was arrested for fraud. And so thus begins the trial of the century at the time. It was in all the papers, both nationally and internationally. Um, and so not only was Mumler on trial, but so was the spiritualist movement, as well as the science and technology of photography. So next slide. Um, a parade of expert photographers were brought in to the, by the prosecution to try to debunk Mumler's process. Um, during the investigation, expert photographers observed Mumler's every step. They came into the studio with him and they watched every step that he, he made, everything that he did. Um, they would even provide him with plates beforehand so they knew that he wasn't able to tamper with them. Um, and they couldn't ever see how he was doing whatever trickery he was being accused of. Um, no one could ever totally prove how he was creating these images. Photographer Jeremiah Gurney, who um, he, he was most famous for his photograph of Lincoln's corpse, which is the only known image of its kind. Um, he testified for the defense. And though he said he didn't necessarily believe Mumler, but he also said he couldn't discount or prove that he was a fraud. So that's uh, pretty significant. Um, so this is a cartoon that was run in the papers at the time, and it's um, depicting a man having his portrait taken at the Mumler studio. And then he's shocked to, to see um, in his portrait, the ghosts of all his previous wives are in the portrait. And we assume that one, the woman he's with is, is, is his next wife. So next slide. Um, when P.T. Barnum took the stand, he was asked by the defense as to why his testimony should be trusted since he'd made deception his business. And Barnum stated, quote, I have always given the people the worth for their money. I've never taken money for things I misrepresented, end quote. Um, Barnum really considered considered his role as an entertainer to only present phenomena that might require his audience to reconsider their understanding of the world. And his argument was that Mumler was claiming that he had photographic evidence and proof of the afterlife. So um, Barnum was trying to really, really prove that uh, Mumler was a fraud, just like a lot of the things that um, Barnum had on display, such as the Fiji mermaid and some other um, hoax type situations. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so eventually after a long and sensational trial, Mumler was acquitted and he was acquitted because nobody could prove without a shadow of a doubt that he was faking the photographs. And so, Although he'd been cleared of the charges of fraud and larceny, his reputation could not recover. And it was so damaged um, that they could no longer stay in New York. And so he and Hannah um, moved back to Boston where it all began. So next slide. Um, and so as 
the the fervor the fervor for spiritualism started to wane. Um, Hannah, ever the entrepreneur, she reinvents herself again as Mrs. D. H. F. Mumler. Or, I'm sorry, as Doctor Mumler, um, and she starts creating tonics and working with mesmerism. Um, and as Hannah's star is ascending in the world of spiritual healers, uh, Mumler is quietly continuing to take a few photographs here and there. Um, but the focus is really on Hannah at this time. Um, and then three years after his acquittal, Mumler creates his and the spirit photography world's most famous image, which is, you know, go to the next slide, this one of Mary Todd Lincoln. And so Mary Todd Lincoln is sitting in the foreground and the translucent image of President Lincoln embracing her from behind. Um, despite Mumler's damaged reputation, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, she believed in this image and she believed in her experience with the, the spirit world. And she, she took it to the grave with her. Um, she was a known follower of the spiritualist movement. And this was actually her second visit to the Mumlers. Um, and this is the last photograph of Mary Todd Lincoln in her life. Um, to some, it's evidence of her gullibility. To others, it represents the suffering of a mother and a wife and of the nation. Um, to her, it was really just the, the comfort that she needed. Um, so people at the time wanted to believe in an enduring connection with their lost loved ones. And the spiritualist movement provided this and it provided this connection. And um, spirit photographers in turn were able to provide evidence of this. Um, so was it fraud? Was it really fraud? I don't know. Um, were the spirit photographers profiting off of others' grief? Or were they providing a comfort to those in need? Um, you know, we also have to think that people at this time, they were not sophisticated consumers of images. Um, they were not inundated with photos like we are today. And so they were not looking at these photos with an understanding of image manipulation. Um, and the power of suggestion really is the driving force here. Um, the beginning of image manipulation that we recognize now as Photoshop and filters and, and all ways of, of, um, of manipulation, um, it has always been a part of the history of photography. Um, but people just didn't know to question this at the time. Um, and what I think is super ironic about this whole situation is that Mumler actually helped to usher in a new era in which the news, the newspapers, which had been predominantly text, um, they began to use photos. And so not only did photos become um, ubiquitous, they became the standard of proof. And so in the end, I just think it's super interesting that the likely manipulator of images played a role in the creation of our like image obsessed culture now. Um, so I don't know, it's, 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 there's some compelling evidence for a uh, hoax. And then there's um, uh, the evidence that nobody could quite figure out how he was doing this. Um, one thing that I do think is interesting though, is that none of the glass plate negatives survive. Um, we think that he destroyed them, which kind of says something, um, but there are lots of prints, um, not a lot, but there still are prints out in the world. Um, UMBC has um, several in their gallery. Uh, people collect them. I would love to collect them. Um, um, you know, even experts at the trial who testified, um, they, they, like I said, they could not, they could not disprove it. So it's kind of up to us what we, what we think. Um, we can go to the, the next slide. Um, these are just some of my resources that I use in the, the research, research for this. Um, these are all awesome books about 
the birth of photography, the invention of photography, um, ghosts, the occult, um, history of photography, um, postmortem photography, <laughs> it's all um, it's all there if anybody is interested. Um, so yeah, I'm free to take questions or comments or what have you. Great. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can figure out. There's my video. Do people now understand how he was pulling this off or how spirit photographs were created? Or is that, should we leave that mysterious? I don't want to leave it mysterious. I would like to know. Like, there's, there's an explanation. So most likely he was somehow manipulating the glass plate negative in the camera because um, the people who were investigating him, they all testified that he wasn't doing any manipulation when he was developing like the print in the dark room. You know how, um, I mean, I don't know how many people have actually like worked in a dark room um, cause it is kind of a lost art at this point. Um, but um, so you know how you would see the, the um, trays and there would be, a, it would be very mysterious and um, uh, very, it would be like, a, the, there's a safe light. So it's red or it's, it's dark in there. And um, uh, so they, the experts who were in the dark room with him were like, yeah, he's not doing anything to the print. And um, several, um, several witnesses testified that as he was developing the, the glass plate negative, that they actually saw the spirits form on the glass plate negative. So he had to have been doing something in camera. That's the only, unless everybody was lying. That's the only thing I can, I can think. Um, and especially since, um, there was the question of of other people that who were alive, like their figures were showing up in the backgrounds. So um, I think it was a double negative situation happening. There's a, a question in the chat box that um, is asking if you know um, of any interaction of enslaved peoples, and I'm gonna go ahead and add free African-American uh, participation in spirit photography. Was anybody, are you aware of that? Is that something that that you've ever heard of or know anything about? I I do not. It's um it's something that I would actually really love to do a little bit more research about. Um, so yeah, um, I have not seen um any images like that. Um, I've seen a few post mortem, um, which I think are interesting. Um, but there's there like as an artifact, there's just not a lot. Yeah, I would add that um, you would ex I would expect to see that because they are um, a little bit of a luxury item mm -hmm. that I wouldn't expect, I'm not saying it's impossible, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of enslaved people being able to spend that kind of money for something like that. Um, but that is a super archaeologist question um, because thinking about how different people separated by class and race were interacting with the dominant sort of pop culture of the time is a really, right. really good question. So um, that is your uh, question asker. That's a great dissertation that you've just developed right there, Andrea Vest Point. Um, I think you should go for it. Um, we have another question. Uh, am I wrong in thinking that these kinds of spirit photographs faded as the technology improved? And I will just yeah. jump in and step on your toes slightly by pointing out that I almost bought a new one on Etsy the other day because I was thinking about this presentation, but you go, Sherry, you go. Um, yes, it, it, it um, definitely has, has faded, but there is, it's a wide genre. Like I didn't even get into like seance photography or like ectoplasma and like all, like it's just, it's, it's crazy. Um, uh, Mumler is definitely the the sort of father of it. Um, it he's the one. It all kind of started with him, um, and then everybody kind of jumped on the bandwagon. Um, I actually I have I only have one spirit photograph in my collection, um, and it's a it's called a cabinet card. It's a little damaged at the top, but um, 
So I'm not sure if this was intended to be a spirit photograph, um, but so we have one child who is solid and then we have another one. Oh, where oh. go? Okay. <laughs> then we have another one that is pretty translucent. And again, this could just be a matter of this, of um, the translucent child um, deciding they didn't want to be in the photograph for the entire exposure and walking away. Um, so um, there's a lot of forged ones and there's a lot of ones that are just accidents, happy accidents. So we have another uh, question bringing this into the rest of the world. Is this a US only phenomenon, Arthur Conan Doyle or were there no. cases in other countries and what was their experience? <laughs> Um, yes, it was all over Europe as well. Yes, um, I, I'm thinking particularly about the um, photographs of fairies that Arthur Conan Doyle, the uh, writer of Sherlock Holmes, was completely convinced yep. were totally real, but there, I believe they had spirit photographs as well. Yep. Another question, what do you think of photographs taken in modern times with cell phones during ghost walks that show orbs? So I love, I love this. Um, I I, I'm willing to believe it is what it is. Um, a, a lot of times though, it's dust in the air um, or it's uh, especially um, it's, or it could be a light leak. It could be a, a reflection, but um, I'm willing to suspend my disbelief and think that it's a, it's a spirit. <laughs> my my boss at work has she takes orb photographs at every available opportunity and it I have to say it's like it's usually really obviously dust but what if we're archaeologists there's a lot of it she's right. their orbs but okay whatever uh do are there I love it I, I mean <laughs> I know they're they have great photographs and I have to tell you that the um the picture that I will show you of Jason's ancestor um, with a time traveling wizard in the background. It could, it seems a little orb like, but it's, a water yeah. spot. it's not a water spot, Jason. It's, it's a, a time traveling spot. wizard. Shut up. Um, <laughs> does anybody else have any questions? It looks like we have a lot of comments that are uh, positive reactions, which is always nice to see. And I agree with all of them. Okay, we've got one more. Um, mm -hmm. oh, real orbs apparently have traces of faces. So that's something to look out for in your um, orb photography. Thank you. And uh, somebody pointing out that Conan Doyle's wife was a self-proclaimed medium. Mm -hmm. I was gonna, oh, so this is a, this is a fantastic book. Um, Perfect Medium Photography in the Occult. It's like a textbook. Um, so like, I mean, you can get into like psychic photography that doesn't even involve cameras and like, um, it's just, it's fascinating. Um, yeah. Like I said, I didn't even get into like mediumship and, um, uh, you know, photographing an actual seance and trying to like, you know, uh, there was a whole part of the spiritualist movement where, um, you would, uh, hold the seance and then there would be a photographer there to photograph like what happened. Um, and those are really interesting to look at. That, that is excellent. Um, okay, hold on just a second here. So I'm going to stop the recording because I, I feel like yes. if you're here in person, you deserve to see the time traveling wizard um, as a special gift. So you can hang out if you want to see this. <laughs> um, 